Hey, welcome back to Unschooled Theology. I am one of your hosts, Derek, and with me is Evan. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, sir. All right, let's dive in. We are in Genesis 3-7, which I will read. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. All right, so one quick small note uh, to start here. There is some suggestion I've read that the idea of loincloths is too primitive a description of the garments that are uh, are proposed, I guess, in this verse, um, <laughs> that uh, that translation is not maybe ideal, but maybe we don't really have a great word to translate it. But it, it, the idea being it's something more covering, I guess, than a loincloth. Um, covering more body? Yeah. Than, than just yeah. loin? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so that's just one small note. Um, but... Uh, to begin with this verse. That feels like the just well, I just a note on that. Yeah, that no. feels like that would connect with the uh uh the historical perspective. If you're looking at this as a historical telling of, oh, of right. humanity, right. um, and you're looking at I mean, I, I don't know. I think there's if you're really, really, really historically minded and you also look at any any sort of idea of of what what uh anthropologists might say about about historical humans you kind of pick and choose but if you're trying to connect uh, a primitive image of humanity what type of dress they might have had right. then you would assume that adam and eve would have come out of eden with that type of dress with initially a, or that would have been what they would have adapted so maybe that's maybe that's that's a subtle sort of attempt at really conforming this narrative to a historical perspective could be could be also could be um i mean I don't know how early that particular translation goes, but you certainly have, uh, I mean, it's described as being put together with fig leaves. So there may be a case for people to make where, well, that how much can like, you do? Yeah. It seems like it would have been a lot of work to make more than just a, a loincloth. Um, <laughs> That's so there's fair. that, there's that case to be made, but also I was going to say the influence of, uh, artistic representations of this, um, mm -hmm. being sort of heavy on that, uh, particular look, a loincloth. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I don't know, all possibilities, I suppose. That's true. That's certainly something to look at too, because you even, I mean, you even see a lot of times uh, Adam and Eve cast out of the garden and they, uh, I've seen a lot where they're naked when they're cast out of the garden. Oh, right. You know, yeah. which is interesting. And I don't know if that's a, that might be some sort of symbolism that they're trying, I don't know, they're trying to play at like this exposed sort of primitive look of humanity, right. I guess. So right. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, in fact, there is some, there's some artistic representations I've seen that begin with them being clothed in like ornate garments inside mm -hmm. the garden and really being naked outside the garden. Really? Which is clearly a symbolic thing mm -hmm. there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Maybe if, if, I don't know if I have time to put it together, maybe we'll do a, an artistic episode on this where we'll look at uh, various artistic representations of, of this particular story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although that would probably be more video based. <laughs> so for our audio listeners, uh, yeah, we'll, have <laughs> we'll, do to come. A, we'll do our best to describe, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll, and we'll, you know, put the images on a, on a website or something. So, um, all right. So let's start with uh, the beginning of this verse here where it's uh, their eyes being opened. Um, now, uh, the first thing I want to point out with this, because I think it's important, again, it goes to one of the common critiques of our, our sort of non-historical approach here. Um, what some people might say, those, you know, historically minded people who want to look at this as an exact, uh, accounting of a moment in time, but a critique of that is that while well, you're picking and choosing what you choose to take literally and what you don't choose to take literally, mm -hmm. uh, except everybody does that because <laughs> this particular verse their eyes being opened not even the most historically minded person you know chooses to take this literally they they clearly mm -hmm. take that as a metaphor right mm -hmm. um so i guess my point there being whether you choose to read this historically or not you are picking at a certain point where to draw the line with metaphors. Cause I I've yet to hear someone who takes a, a historical approach, look at this and say, uh, yeah, no, that they, they, they had closed eyes the whole time in the garden. Yeah. And somehow yeah. Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was good for this or that with closed eyes. 
right? Yeah. You've exactly. not heard that because that's ridiculous. And that's kind of the point is when you choose to take things literally and sometimes, you know, some of these old Bible passages, you do reach a point where those two things would then contradict each other. So clearly one mm-hmm. or both or all must be a metaphor at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and this yeah. isn't the first time we've run into that. We ran into that with the, yeah. uh, we ran into that with the snake, correct? With the, with the, with the, t- the thing that the snake says, or, yes. or, or God says on that day, you surely will die or you will yes, die. Yes. We talked about that being um, most well, the death itself, you know, most people's death are we talking about? Exactly. Either it's some sort of metaphorical death or, or day is, is strange, which nobody tends to argue. Right. Uh, but in some way you're having to stretch the meaning of that phrase, yes. um, which just makes more sense. There's places where metaphors are being used. That's how communication happens, yep. you know? Yeah. Uh, okay, so like if, if we want to look here, the first thing I want to look at is the, is the term opened. Um, and this is not an often used verse. There's maybe, or, or not verse, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. word. Uh, there's maybe a few dozen other times where you see it pop up in the Bible. Um, again, if you go to Blue Letter Bible, you can go there and look and see all of the occasions that it's used. And if you look at that and look at the context around each of those occasions, uh, it does occasionally refer to a physical act, but mm-hmm. it's only ever the eyes when it's a physical mm-hmm. act. No one says they open the door, the tent, the whatever, right? Uh, it never relates to that. It only relates to the eyes or um, something sort of spiritual. And in fact, even when the eyes are mentioned, there's something kind of metaphysical in the context of each of those verses where that happens. So it's mm. my, my point here being this word for opened clearly is not about physical open. <laughs> it's clearly this is a word that means something spiritual, right? Mm. Um, so it describes a sort of spiritual awakening of sorts that occurs at, at the beginning of this verse. Um, and then there's something that. There's something yeah. interesting that just to just to insert because I think it's interesting when other traditions rhyme uh, with that. I mean, I think mm-hmm. there's there's a significance to the fact that like Eastern religions emphasize um, spiritual awakening by talking about a third eye, mm-hmm. by talking about some and and opening a third eye that some sort of perception happens or your attention gets shifted right. um, and you're able to perceive better. And then also. Um, the Egyptians have that same thing. They're, I can't remember the name of the god right now, but their uh, prime deity uh, was represented just by an eye. And that's why we still down to today on the dollar bill have the eye okay, over the pyramid, uh, which Horus people, or something like Horus, I, I think it's Horus, but I'm not told, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on that. Um, okay. But I think it's Horus, but there's a couple of different ones. Um, but he, the prime deity is, is, is represented as an eye, as, as, as this symbolic yeah. um, representation of attention or perception or um, what you're looking at. And so I think that that's significant that that other spiritual uh, traditions like, like stumble onto that. And, they, mm-hmm. and they, they see that that's something very, very significant about humanity, that we have a different means of perceiving. Um, and then... And then obviously here in Adam and Eve, we see that we, tr- we try to explore the origin of that or the origin of that, I guess, is, is, is fleshed out. Right. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So with that idea, we can go to the, the fruit here um, and we can, we could say that the point, uh, the, there's a spiritual recognition that occurs as a result of eating this fruit. Mm-hmm. Um. And this is very much how wrongdoing works at an early age, right? It's Mm -hmm. the act of doing something wrong that leads you to sort of understand the significance of doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Your parents tell you, don't touch the hot stove, right? Uh, You oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, kids have to learn (laughs) just exactly why that instruction is being given. Mm -hmm. by doing what they were told not to do right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so it's that is uh kind of what we're talking about here in terms of with the fruit um and again so if we take this as this spiritual opening of the eyes not uh not like a physical opening of the eyes not a physical thing is occurring 
We don't mm -hmm. need to, even if you look at this historically and, and choose to take that perspective, we don't have to see this as like the fruit contained some special information that was passed through to, to mm -hmm. the man and woman's, you know, uh, a brain as a result mm -hmm. of the consumption of this fruit. Yeah. Um, that's clearly not what it is. It's more that the, the act of defiant wrongdoing uh -huh. uh, imparts the knowledge. There's nothing special about the fruit per se, other than mm -hmm. the fact that God designated it as off limits. Yeah. And yeah. so then partaking of it is what opened their eyes to the realization of, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And that's, I think that that's, uh, I think that that's inherent in the fact that I think it's a reasonable interpretation because it, the story doesn't indicate otherwise. It doesn't right. indicate that that because of the fruit that happened. And, and, and the thing that it said that on that day, you surely will die uh, doesn't, at least unless we're going to take it metaphorically, which we probably should, that doesn't immediately happen. It doesn't seem to be poison fruit. That's not the right. way it's displayed in the limited details that we have. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to, to say that that's the reason the fruit causes that is simply because it was pr prohibited. It's not because it was poison fruit. It's because right. it was prohibited fruit. And the act is the thing that causes yes. that. The fruit could be yeah. any other, like any other fruit. Yeah, or it could be any other boundary, right? It could have been, you know, go Correct. beyond this gate or you will die, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you mm -hmm. go beyond that gate, perhaps you discover, you know, the scary world outside, right? The, I mean, uh, all sorts of stories are full of that, that kind of process of discovering why, uh, a, a restriction was put in place by violating that, uh, that restriction yeah. or that boundary or that limitation. So, well, and I think it's important to emphasize too, that I think, um, it's like, well, with it, let's say the example that you gave was, uh, was the hot stove. The hot stove has immediate, uh, uh immediate feedback in that you right. touch it almost right. immediate feedback, um, and, and you burn your hand. Um, and so it's like you, you, act of defiance, immediate pain mm -hmm. lesson. Um, whereas with, I, I think what might be even being suggested here is that it's act of defiance. And then the pain actually comes when God issues punishment. And so I think the fact that those are separated here suggests that act of defiance in and of itself, independent of the consequences immediately happening, causes this eye opening. So, so, so let's say you, you, let's say you, uh, you rebel against your parents, you do something that you're not supposed to, and they don't find out about it, but suddenly you have this feeling of guilt that you haven't felt before. Like, I think that might be the process that you're, you're seeing go yeah. on here. Yeah. And that doesn't have to do necessarily with your parents punishing you right then. No, Maybe right, they punish you right, later, but right. it has more to do. It doesn't even have to do necessarily with the 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 tangible consequences it's the internal no, there's consequences a spiritual that consequence. take the spiritual yeah. consequences exactly that yeah. take place yeah yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. i think that's important yeah agreed agreed all right so uh next uh real quick i just want to hit on this idea of knowing because this is kind of interesting it's the same term that's used in verse five mm -hmm. uh when the serpent says god will or god knows right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same no that's used later in that verse. Um, but this is, and actually to, to show the distinction, I should read that. So let me uh, pull that up again. Uh, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so that knowing there is, is actually different. Um, but this knows here uh it's god knowing that is a little bit different than adam and eve knowing good and evil there but what god knows is a little bit different so i think that tells us that sort of just as god knew what would happen as a result of them eating of the fruit uh the man and woman do now have that knowledge right like the gods mm -hmm. so in a way the serpent wasn't lying <laughs> they do now have a, a knowledge they know something like god did except the problem is now they know uh the problems 
with yeah. with their choices. So yeah. um, but it's interesting to see that the the knowledge there is is similar. Yeah. Um, and then of course the because they now can see themselves with this new knowledge, this new knowing uh, that is similar to God's knowing, right? Mm -hmm. In that previous verse, uh, now they are aware of their nakedness, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, the, it's the recognition of what, uh, what they've done, the, this realization of uh, this failure to uh, stick to what they were were sort of told to do or meant to do in the garden i think uh when we get to the end of uh of this whole section here at the end of chapter three we'll probably do an episode on what exactly sin is because i think by the end we'll have a clearer picture but mm -hmm. they know at least as a result of their sin they're naked mm -hmm. uh that is what they see and what's interesting here is the term that's used for nakedness mm -hmm. Because uh, this is different than what we see at the end of chapter two. Mm -hmm. And again, if you go look at the usages of these different terms, that term what, that we see at the end of chapter two, where they're told that they were naked and unaware of it, uh, that term for naked, where it's used in the Bible, tends to be uh, involved with a more childlike innocence, right, mm -hmm. in terms of its, its nakedness. But the term that is used here, when we see that one repeated throughout the Bible, it is uh, associated with more the idea of shame and inadequacy. Mm. So that is, I, I think, the terminology being used um, describes for us the shift, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a physical shift that happens. It's a spiritual shift, right? Their, their nakedness, in a way, changed. It was no longer innocent. It was now shameful and sort of a recognition of human in that, uh, inadequacy, not, not an innocence. I think there's a, I think, I think that's incredibly powerful, especially considering what we talked about with the serpent and how the serpent posed the temptation because the serpent posed the temptation, um, which we've talked about in past episodes, um, as in, you even just said, not lying, the, the serpent didn't lie outright and say that you wouldn't acquire this knowledge. It seems more so that information was withheld of that. You will acquire this knowledge, but you won't be able to bear it. Like you aren't, you are not capable of holding this knowledge and dealing right. with that. And so that's, that makes sense that this rebellion leads to an immediate understanding of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going back to the, to the child example is actually a good one because um, because acts of defiance, when really recognized within yourself, it's, it's a recognition that you can be malicious, that you can be, def I mean, at minimum defiant, but then at worst, you can be malicious. Um, and if you truly recognize that, um, it, it opens this, this possibility of not only the evil that lies within yourself, but also the potential that lies within everything else. And that you, you really you, if everything else is just as malicious as you potentially can be, you are exposed. I mean, you do run the risk of, 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 of being, of, you, you're completely exposed. Yeah. Um, and leading up to that, you believe in the benevolence of everything. And that's why you can be fully exposed and not be, um, not be ashamed of it, not be afraid to not recognize your own vulnerability. But the minute you see the, the, the malice that's inside of you, you recognize, oh my gosh, that can be in anybody else as well. Well, and I would go even a little further, too, to say that um, it's not even just the malice. It's like the, the capacity. And once, you, once yeah. you recognize the capacity within yourself, you also see the inadequacy, right? Because you see the point at which the capacity fails, mm -hmm. right? You recognize the limit of it. And so if you're, if you're a kid and just following the rules and doing what you're told and doing all of those things, mm -hmm. then you you don't know your capacity mm -hmm. right you only just know that i can just do these things right because mm -hmm. these are what i'm told to do but once you realize well i can go beyond that by doing something i wasn't supposed to do then you now realize oh i can go even further but now you realize well i don't even really understand 
what the limitations of my capacity are, where that cutoff is. There is clearly that point. There's clearly things beyond my ability mm. to do. And it just mm. opens up this whole new world, right? Mm. And you start to see yourself then clearly as limited, right? Um, as unable to do certain things, unable to handle certain things. You want to have this capacity to do more. You can't. And so there's something shameful in, yeah. that in a way. Yeah, that's really there's, interesting. There's a lot there. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think it, I think it, um, it makes me think of the 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 reaction that uh, you often have when if you watch any of those videos that like uh, that try to display the expanse of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, like there's this most people have um, some feeling of discomfort with that. Um, and what it feels like is it's like as long as I'm looking at the earth, as long as I'm looking at the things around me, it's all relatively quaint and absorbable and I can comprehend and I can work within those constraints. But as it expands and expands and expands and expands, um, my knowledge, my eyes are certainly being opened, but my insufficiency is often is being emphasized as well. Like, like right. my insignificance, how actually small I am compared to all of this expanse. And right. that definitely I mean, shame might be a good, but insufficiency is definitely the feeling. You feel exposed. You feel like I, I, I'm not capable of wrestling with this idea. And right. so, the idea that that you propose, which is, I think that's, I think that's true. That that the minute you push beyond the boundaries that have been established for you, it's like breaking through a wall and then seeing this this unbearable expanse before you, right. you don't, you can't comprehend it. It's too overwhelming. And so like that with the physical analogy being of what space might do to somebody that's, that's this, that's what the uh, breaking through like a spiritual boundary is like. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. And there'd be shame there. So, um, yeah. and then, I mean, most importantly here, we see that uh, they, they see this nakedness is something to cover up right? Mm -hmm. um, they can't bear it so much that it needs to be covered up. So at the end of this verse, we see them uh, making a covering for themselves. We'll just say mm -hmm. coverings. It's again, the loincloth issue. Um, the detail of leaves, we'll get into that in a moment. The specificity of it being a fig tree and fig leaves, obviously relatable to the people in the area that are hearing this, right? Um, as to the this, this symbolism of the fig tree, I don't, I don't have much to say about that right now. Uh, I don't have much thought on that right now, other than we know that at different points in the Bible, uh, the nation of Israel is related to a fig tree that's seen as like a symbol for Israel. Mm -hmm. And of course, this also, I think, sets up, I, I think that, I guess my point here is the key of the fig it being a fig tree is not so much about this moment, but the, what will reference back to the fig in a mm -hmm. way um, again through Israel. And ultimately, of course, it sets up one of my favorite and yet most bizarre and interesting passages when Jesus has an interaction with a fig tree, right? Where he curses mm -hmm. the fig tree for not producing the fruit, um, mm -hmm. which again, I would say symbolically relates to Israel quite obviously. Um, but that is, this is setting that up. We begin with the figs here, I guess. Uh, we'll put yeah, it if we wanted to extend it, I don't know, is potentially Israel then seen as uh, as a means of, of covering up the well, nakedness yes, of humanity? Sure. You sure. know, that's yeah. The, yeah. the building of a nation like that mm -hmm. is an attempt to, to do right. that. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but in, in, many, in many ways, Israel failed, right, to produce exactly. the fruit that it was meant to. Um, yeah. in a way, right? And that's sort of what Jesus is getting to with the, the cursing the fig tree. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so anyways, the fig is not necessarily as important symbolically at this moment, but this sets the stage for references back. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So as for the leaves, this I think is pretty interesting um, because it's an attempt to cover up sin with something that is earth-based, right? And not spiritual. Mm -hmm. We've talked from, from the beginning about the idea of the heavens and the earth, right? And the idea of the spiritual and sort of the, the earthy, the matter-based things. And so what, what they're attempting to do with the, the leaves here is covering up with something matter-based. It doesn't contain anything spiritual to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is in contrast to what we'll see later, 
when God covers their nakedness with uh, animal animal skin, right? Because animal skin, we know, are the, uh, going back to Genesis 1, described as these um, soulish creatures. Mm -hmm. So they're not like humans. They're not, you know, perfectly you know, part earthy and part God breathes, but there's something of a, of a soul like nature to them. Mm -hmm. There's something quasi sort of spiritual about that. And that obviously carries on to the idea of the lamb and the, the sacrifices of, of lamb and meat and these mm -hmm. kind of things, uh, you know, on through, uh, through the Bible up until we get to Jesus, obviously being now then the fullness of that sacrificial garment covering idea. Um, but it's interesting to see them here. They're in effect trying to fix the consequences of their sins through the material. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very much what humans do, right? Uh, this is what we do. We sin or we, we realize our inadequacies and we attempt to use the material to make it as though those inadequacies don't exist or to hide those inadequacies from ourselves. Um, I mean, in a way, we could argue that's kind of what we do with all technical in innovation, right, is we're trying to make up for our deficiencies and make ourselves better and better. We build shelters to stay in so that our, our you know, fleshy body bags are, that are not made to stay out in all sorts of weather, now we have a, a protected uh, area, right? Um, and we do that with material things. Well, we we kind of go there first with spiritual too right uh, someone makes a mistake does something spiritually wrong they attempt to find some material means to cover it the the starkest example of this maybe that we could go to in the bible is uh king david with bathsheba right so he makes a he he sins with bathsheba who's he sees her bathing on the roof he ends up uh, uh, committing adultery with her and then to cover it up by a material means he sends Bathsheba's husband to the front lines to get killed well that's a material way to try and fix the sin did it really fix it no of course not right um, but that is what we try to do is find some sort of material means to fix the sin that is what the idea of sort of the covering with fig leaves here that's what that kind of represents I think there's um, as as we're as we're going through this story. I think it's I think it's very interesting how quaint this story is uh, in comparison to the potential evils and actually really the evils that we see no more than one or two chapters further in the Bible. Yeah, um, this is eating fruit, and 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 then then the when we see the first two quote unquote, real humans, the first born of flesh, mm -hmm. uh, we see murder. Right. I, I think it's interesting that this is started this, that this is not, um, it's, it doesn't feel like we, like a very uh, deeply it's, it's consequential in the effects, but it doesn't feel deeply consequential in the actual act. Um, right. and, and that's why I think it's interesting that you, that, that, that we're using almost interchangeably sin with, uh, with, with this, really, it's the recognition of inadequacy and the attempt to cover up inadequacy by this. Mm -hmm. They're covering sin, but the sin caused them to recognize inadequacy. And that's right. what they're trying to solve at this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that is, that is even more broadly applicable than just material attempts to cover up sin. Um, because I think, I, I think, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I can't think of any human being who probably wouldn't relate to that, to using some sort of material means of covering up inadequacy, whether right. it's the clothing right. you wear, whether it's attempting to acquire a particular position um, sure. in, a, in a company or in a career or a certain amount of money or a particular relationship or a particular image or a particular uh, a set of knowledge or a degree or anything. Um, those are all modern examples mm -hmm. and those stretch back going farther back too, but at, you, attempting to use material things to cover up spiritual inadequacies. That's, that's the, that's everything, you know, or, mm -hmm. or you can even go the pleasure route then too, whether it's food, drink, sex, any well, yeah. type of thing. I mean, I was going to say that what you're describing, we might use, as I was saying, right, the house, the, the, the shelter to cover a, a material inadequacy 
right? Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. do that. We all use material things to deal with material inadequacies, mm -hmm. right? Well, uh, well yes. To deal with material inadequacies. Yeah. Uh, my point here is that here we have a spiritual inadequacy. That's what I mean. Yeah. But we, we convert to, well, we got to go to material means, right? And that really gets exactly. to the things you were talking about later, especially the food, sex, drugs, all these kinds of things. Those well, then are I think we do it. We're really taking it to the extreme, trying to seek like a spiritual thing from these matter based uh, things. We're, we're seeking some kind of spiritual solution. If you look at treatment for addiction to those things, it never centers around, you know, matter based stuff. It, it mm -hmm. focuses on the spiritual. <laughs> You know, it's the almost like it's 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 that programs those kind of things right it's 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 almost it's one of the clearest um because i've dealt with a, uh quite a few people who've gone through those programs mm -hmm. and that that is that is the hallmark of them and one of the clearest things that they have to establish. They have to establish some sort of spiritual grounding to make any sort of progress mm -hmm. related to addiction. Right. Otherwise, right. it's otherwise it's never they never make progress. Yeah, it's it's that's not, that's the that is that is a prerequisite to to making to making any sort of progress. That's because it's not a material problem. None of those things are a material problem. Mm -hmm. They are a material solution to a mm -hmm. spiritual problem. Mm -hmm. But that those material solutions, because yeah. they are inadequate for the spiritual problem, suddenly start creating material problems, right? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. drunk driving being an obvious example, right? Or damage to your health by a, a hard drugs or something like that, right? You know, all of these things, they create material problems because you're using material to try and fix a spiritual thing. Yeah, I think if you... Um... So if you, I guess my that's why I like treat that's them as a material problem, you're not going to make any progress. Well, and that's why I like broadening it out and saying, look, like, I think, I think, and that's, you don't have to be an addict to recognize this. I think we mm -hmm. do that with, with pursuing a particular career or status or, or, or financial success or things like that, which are material solutions to a feeling of spiritual uncertainty. Um, people people if, who have a bad day and have to go out and get a, an ice cream cone are doing that. They're, yeah. They yeah. are doing that, you know, like it's, it's a smaller version. It's, it, it's not, you know, a full blown addiction or something, but people who mm -hmm. have had a long day and think, well, I just need some ice cream. That's what they're doing. They're trying to look for a material thing to make them feel better of what is in fact a spiritual issue, right? Yeah. How they feel about that day. That is a spiritual thing. Yeah. So I want to like two things on the bookends of this, like at the beginning of this, because we need to look at the front, the front end is the two types of sins that occur. The one where Eve sort of actively does it. And then Adam sort of passively mm -hmm. just allows it to happen. I think that's important to recognize that, that you can get this feeling of adequacy because you've been maybe, let's say actively, you've actively sinned or because you've just let things happen. Mm -hmm. You recognize your right. inadequacy. Right. Um, and then at the other end of it, I, I know we will get into this more with, with God, with when God actually intervenes and makes skins. But if you look at the skins, it's, it's this soulish thing. And also it, it still has that element of material. So I think it's important to, to recognize that, that, um, we're not denigrating houses and we're not saying that clothes are bad things. And we're not saying that material things right. are bad things, but they have been um, it's when we endow those things. Um, it's when we, we direct those things towards a spiritual purpose that they become, that they fit the, the purpose that they're supposed to, that they're meant to, as opposed to just saying, no, I'm going to use the purely material to solve this problem. It's like, no, I need the spiritual direction first, and then I can incorporate the material in the proper way. Yeah. It's about, it's about having a heart of contentedness, you know, to go to Paul, right. The, and this idea where the material things shouldn't have a spiritual effect on you in that way, mm -hmm. right. They should, they should address material issues um mm -hmm. but they shouldn't they shouldn't be used to address spiritual issues and concerns mm -hmm. so having a great job or whatever like that's fine but you know for material ends but if you're if you're pursuing climbing the corporate ladder because of some sort of spiritual motivation you think it'll give you some sort of spiritual satisfaction 
that's that's not the right way to do that that's that's not what you need to be pursuing right you don't need to you don't need to get your second summer home <laughs> uh you know as as some sort of fixing of of a spiritual issue it's not going to do that and it never does i mean we this is not just christians i mean people constantly point out how money doesn't really make people happier mm -hmm. because more stuff doesn't solve you know uh, uh, spiritual concerns mm -hmm. um and so that's you know what uh that is i guess doing that is creating fig leaves for yourself basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, all right. So if we want to wrap this verse up, um, I think in this verse, we see sort of a, a full summary of where humanity finds itself as a product of sin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going again to this idea of this teaching uh, universal sin, not, to, not original sin, but universal sin. Um, you know, because we have a moral compass, right, that we're sort of endowed with, we recognize our own inadequacies and our instinct is to look to the earthy realm to craft for ourselves some sort of solution mm -hmm. that can cover our, our spiritual nakedness, the sort of the reality of who we are. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. With that, I think we'll wrap up and uh, be sure to like, subscribe, follow Sign up for our uh, email newsletter. Email us, unschooledtheology at protonmail.com. Check out our website, unschooledtheology.com. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.